aber die Welt hat es versäumt, ihn auf gerechte Weise bereitzustellen. Das Human Rights Council bei der UN stellte vor wenigen Tagen fest, dass mehr als 600.000 Todesfälle hätten verhindert werden können, wenn alle Länder der Welt in die Lage versetzt worden wären, das Impfziel der Weltgesundheitsorganisation zu erreichen. Dieses Versagen, so der Human Rights Council, war tragisch und zutiefst unmoralisch. Nicht einmal inmitten einer globalen Gesundheitskrise stellt die Politik und die Wirtschaft ihre Politik des Business as usual in Frage. Besonders sichtbar, wir erinnern uns, wurde diese Weigerung entgegen von Forderungen und sozialen Bewegungen überall auf der Welt, die Patente auf Impfstoffe freizugeben. Deutschland übrigens war federführend darin, diese Koalition der Unwilligen anzuführen, sie zu organisieren und trägt damit eine direkte Mitverantwortung auch für die tödlichen Folgen dieser Weigerung. Ein politisches Versagen, und darüber werden wir auch heute Nachmittag sprechen, das Auswirkungen hat weit über die Pandemie hinaus. Europa hat das ohnehin schon sehr fragile Vertrauen in den Ländern des globalen Südens verspielt. Und dies in einer Zeit von Kriegen und einer globalen Klimakrise, wo globale Strategien nicht nur wichtig, sondern überlebensnotwendig sind. Die Folgen sind verheerend und haben eine gesundheitliche, eine soziale und eine politische Dimension und verweisen auf das, was wir gemeinsam mit der Verwobenheit in der Klimakrise und dem sich ausweitenden Kriegsgeschehen im Titel eine Weltkrise genannt haben. Und wir werden heute exemplarisch uns über sehr viele Stränge diesem Thema nähern. Und das ist vielleicht auch ganz schön viel. Und deswegen möchte ich, bevor ich jetzt mich freue, zu Norman Weber überzugehen, nochmal auf ein Buch verweisen. Das ist nämlich der Global Health Watch, der sogenannte Alternative Weltgesundheitsbericht. Und in dem werden ganz viele der Themen, über die wir heute sprechen, nochmal in der Tiefe aufgegriffen und zusammengeführt. Das ist also eine große Leseempfehlung. Vielen Dank. Buenas tardes. That is Spanish. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm going to speak in Spanish. You are going to have interpretation. I hope that is going to be fine. Um, my presentation is going to refer especially to the global south uh, health situation. And so I hope that is uh, going to be at least uh, important to you to understand how our countries are uh, performing now after uh, the pandemic of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. In the People's Charter 2000, The People's Health Movement stated that the health crisis of the poor and the marginalized had worsened and that the root of this crisis was the deepening of inequality, poverty, exploitation, violence and injustice. 22 years later, the OECD states that we live in an era of multiple crises, shocks and uncertainties that will affect at least the 24% of the world population that live 
insisting fragile context of growing conditions of poverty and inequality. However, today we are not only experiencing the crisis of this context, but a more general one resulting from the systemic crisis of capitalism, ecology, and wars. This crisis explains the greater frequency and recurrence of epidemics and pandemics, migrations, the persistence of non-communicable diseases, the re-emergence of the threat of nuclear hecaton and the extinction of life itself. Behind the noting of this crisis, is an economic system of large transnational corporations that has captured multilateral agencies and states to control and expand markets to accumulate profits, reducing their ability to respond to the consequences of the crisis and create conditions to guarantee people's well-being and the care of health and life. This context has led to fragile health systems to become incapable of responding to the challenges of the present. The fragility of health systems refers to their inability to meet the needs of communities and contribute to avoiding the sanitary dangers that threaten us. For instance, the COVID-19 pandemic showed that the disruption of essential health services in Latin America and the Caribbean was 80% in low-income countries, 75% in middle-income countries, and 24% in high-income countries. The region's health systems were not only overhand in their ability to mitigate the damage caused by the pandemic, except for Cuba and Costa Rica, but they were also unable to implement effective strategies to prevent and control it. For instance, primary health care did not work in most of the Latin American health systems because of underfunding, shortage of health workers, or simply because the lack of a comprehensive private health care approach in these systems. The commodification and privatization of the Latin American health system is what made them less effective in health surveillance, prevention, and health promotion, made them inadequate to address the inequitable access to health services and prevent them from allocating resources with equity among regions and social positions. Furthermore, the regional health systems have been dominated by a biomedical approach to healthcare reinforced by decades of commodification and privatization that excludes indigenous communities' knowledge and practices and makes interculturality difficult. For instance, Latin American countries have, on average, two doctors per 1,000 people, while, while Haiti, Guatemala, and Honduras have, on average, only all two, three doctors per 1,000 people. Also, the health spending in Latin American countries grew, on average, three dollars per six percent per year, while the gross domestic product grew three percent per year. Health spending was approximately 1,000 US dollars per person on average, while that of the OECD countries was four times as much. In the Latin American countries, 
If the Latin American countries try to reach the level of healthcare expenditure of developed countries with the actual model of biomedical health systems, the level of health expenditure needs needed to meet their people's needs will be unreachable for most of them. Scientific evidence tells us that the global health spending doubled between 2000 and 2013 to 735 trillion American dollars. Most growth driven by technology costs and rising demand. In 2021-2022, OECD countries spent an average of around 9.5% of GDP on healthcare. The US spending a hefty inefficient 17%. In 2020, 2021 alone, US expenditure on prescription medicines was $348 billion. The upper end of total estimated annual growth of achieving universal health coverage across all countries by 2030. Any, even remotely genuine attempt at universal health care incorporating access both to basic public health and more advanced NCD treatments would drive many low and middle income countries into a form of health bankruptcy within months. Behind this growing tendency of healthcare expenditure is the transnational corporations' drive to profit making, which is not possible to achieve without unlimited economic growth, which at the same time explains the continuous trend of privatization and commodification of health systems in both high income and low middle income countries. To achieve this end, the current universal health coverage policy has been formulated as a component of the current neoliberal economic order. However, we must bear in mind that the proposal to build a new international economic order has been re-emerging to counteract the unequal economic chain that hinders the economic and social development of the countries of the Global South. The same group of actors that today leads this proposal, proposal also proclaims the need to constitute again a movement of non-aligned countries in the face of the pretensions of standing a Cold War scenario again. The dominant and highly expensive model of universal health coverage promoted by the World Bank and the World Health Organization, we must say that, goes against the need of a broader socioeconomic transformation linked to a comprehensive intercultural and equitable health systems, since it emphasizes on domestic resources mobilization, public single payer financing, and an anthropocentric biomedical and disease center health care model that is functional to the privatization and commodification of health systems. Primary health care, we must remember, is a strategy that could give us a different content to a new health system policy embedded in a new international economic order. However, primary health care has been emptied of his comprehensive and intercultural content, like it was pro 
proclaimed in Alma Adam in 1978 towards a new selective approach that make the universal health coverage policy reforms functional to private and market interests. In the declaration of Alma Adam, it was established that primary health care forms an integral part of both the national health system, of which it constitutes the central function and the main nucleus, and of the overall social and economic development of the community. But most importantly, paragraph 3 of the 1978 Alma Mata Declaration on Primary Health Care states economic and social development based on a new international economic order is of basic importance to the fullest attainment of health for all and to the reduction of the gap between the health status of the developing and developed countries. The promotion and protection of health of the people is essential to sustain economic and social development and contributes to a better quality of life and to world peace. In this sense, primary health care was understood as a strategy that could contribute not only to improving average health outcomes, but also health equity and an efficient use of health systems resources. In his recent book, Walking the Talk 2022, the World Bank has recognized the importance of the ALMA principles to guarantee healthcare centered on the population through multidisciplinary teams that ensure first contact, integration, coordination, and continuous individual care through the healthcare system levels. It has also recognized the need for intersectoral action and community participation to respond not only to clinical care needs, but also to other social determinants of health. But one of the problems of this bank, World Bank approach is that it does not acknowledge the interrelationships between health systems, primary health care, and the international and national economic order. Other problem is that the World Bank proposal on primary health care is again based on the principle of cost effectiveness and cost efficiency. The World Bank and even WHO does not recognize the need to change the prevailing international national economic order to transform and decolonize health systems and to strengthen comprehensive primary health care to face poverty and health inequalities, the socio-ecological crisis and the greater frequency and recurrence of pandemics and other sanitary emergencies. The new international economic order as it was adopted by the sixth special session of the United Nations General Assembly in 1974 was subsequently eroded and reversed by the debt crisis and structural adjustment policies of the 80s by the Uruguay round which led to the launch of the World Trade Organization in 1994 and by the rise of neoliberalism. Now it has been replaced by the Sustainable Development Goals and contrary to Almada declaration, primary health care has been made dependent on the nature of neoliberal healthcare system policies within the same capital accumulation regime. In this sense, primary health care has been made functional to the privatization commodification of health systems through a new selective primary care approach centered on a massive biomedical care model. 
We know that for the Global South to achieve the targets of improving health, health equity and preserving life, a new international economic order is an unavoidable condition. The call for a renewed vision of the new international economic order adapted to the 21st century has been made explicit by the Declaration of Santa Cruz for a new world order for living well that was adopted by the G77 and China in June 2014 on the 50th anniversary of the formation of the G77 by the Contax 2022 Trade and Development Report and by the declaration of the 50th anniversary of the new International Economic Order in the Congress of Havana in January 2023. This new International Economic Order proposal would include, for instance, the regulation of global finances, the taxation of transnational corporations and the promotion of domestic tax reforms, access to know-how and health technologies, the regulation and supervision of the activities of transnational corporations through the creation, perhaps, of a code of conduct, the respect of economic, social and cultural people's rights at the national and global level, the transformation of the current practice of the investment agreements and of unequal exchanges amongst nations, the promotion of global solidarity and the decolonizing of AIDS and the protection of the environment. However, instead of promoting a new international economic order and a comprehensive approach to primary health care, the World Bank has been involved in the Sustainable Development Goal, as I said before, and on, the, on several new selective primary health care programs to maintain the actual capital accumulation regime and to narrow down the comprehensiveness of the Armand Atta Declaration. This selective approach to primary health care, which has contributed to the organization of targeted and cost-efficient packages of individual biomedical interventions and insurable benefit plans now seeks to integrate essential public health functions and social assistance activities generalizable through the universal health coverage policy. This model of neo-selective primary health care allows public private insurers and healthcare providers organizations to create markets for the provision of primary healthcare services directly or through private managers that contract to network of private public primary healthcare services providers based on the use of multidisciplinary teams in areas with assigned population Adequate schemes, continuity and coordination of care, capitation payment methods, financial incentive, and free job of provider by patients. With this approach, it is possible to end up creating integrated network of insurers, managers, and providers that can give rise to private primary care corporations. Certain financing designs linked to strategic purchasing arrangement and payment methods may end up as well fragmenting the primary care strategy on or limiting its comprehensiveness as is currently the case in several Latin American healthcare systems such as the Colombian General Health System of Social Insurance or the Chilean a general healthcare system of social insurance as well, if there is not a strong and organized government intervention. This urban approach 
maintains an unnecessary separation between clinical interventions and public health. It prevents private health care from being linked to the good living of communities and territories by drastically separating central sectoral health actions, for instance, primary, clinical, and public health care through multidisciplinary teams from intersectoral actions and community involvement. As some PHN colleagues say, first, the model of private health care offered in the Alma Alta Declaration suggests that as well as focusing on primary care, healthcare practitioners and agencies can find ways of working with their communities on understanding and addressing the structural barriers to better health, ranging from the locally specific to the global barriers. The struggle for a new international economic order will not be determined in the health sector alone, but health is universally valued and perhaps can provide a narrative of change which can be shared across boundaries. The language of social determinants or social determination, as we say in Latin America, of health provides an existing narrative regarding the links between the local and the global, the micro and the macro. We cannot give up changing society and transforming the colonizing health systems. The time has come to reconnect the struggle for health with the struggle for a new international economic order and the struggle for peace of the non-aligned movement with the struggle, with the struggle for peace of the non-aligned movement. As the Havana Declaration said, we must deal a planetary block laid by the South and reinforced by the solidarities of the North to make visible the new international economic order, peace and a comprehensive approach to primary health care and to health systems. Thank you very much.
give a more bird eye view. Imagine you are a bird looking at the world. And I'm going to take you back in time because hopefully at the end of my talk about death and hell, uh, you will understand the basis of our struggle in the globe itself. Because when I talk about death, I'm not just talking about money. Like Roman say, we are now faced with multiple crises. And one of them is the global economic recession, or debt crisis, deemed to have been caused by COVID-19 pandemic. And this is not true. Uh, even in the 2020 OPAD report, that is the UN body for trade and development, they already say that developing countries of all income categories were already heading towards debt crisis prior to the pandemic. And recently, the United Nations estimates that over 50 countries, this is just coming out last month, over 50 countries, making up for more than half of the world's poorest people, are in need of immediate debt relief to avoid even more extreme poverty, even more. So, the issue of the debt in Global South is a very complex one. And it goes beyond the standard economic assumptions of equal spending, free market exchange. The massive dollar denominated debt in the Global South are a result of a carefully designed international financial system that facilitates neo-colonial extraction. So this system has forced governments in the global south and households to enter into debt in order to maintain basic, very basic living standards. And it creates a vicious cycle where the large share of income then flows to creditors at the top of the income distribution globally. So usually, in order for financially vulnerable borrowers to obtain loans with favorable conditions, they would need to accept conditions that involve relinquishing some degree of control over their government's financial policies, essentially putting certain aspects of their sovereign state functions at risk. And this is a practice that has gone on since the colonial era. The involvement of politics and power dynamics has elevated international loans to highly significant political issues with diplomatic considerations playing a major role in these loans. Wealthy individuals and influential groups in the creditor nations hold the power to reject loans requests from governments whose policies they view as unfavorable to their own interests. So, the result of this financial strangulation, of course, then also political strangulation for the benefit of the interests of the more developed economies that control also the international financial institutions. And these organizations have experienced and employ well-known mechanisms of debt trap diplomacy to deepen the neo-colonial plundering of the natural resources and profits from the global south. And it went on like that for most of 19th century, well into the early 20th century, and then continue on after World War II. So, in early 1970s, voices in the global south argued that the, colonial, the decolonization has led to neo-colonialism due to Global North's private investments in Global South, resulting in expatriated profits and natural resources, also human labor. So the point is that the whole process and system put in place after World War II was lacking in fulfillment of the promises of independence of the global south and also of development. So, like Roman said, in 1973-74, there were calls for a new international 
Economic Order, or MIEO for short, that would establish a fairer world, okay? and also turn dependence into development, real development. And the MIEO negotiations were launched in 74 to break these international constraints on growth in developing countries. So they asked to regulate and supervise transnational corporations, strengthen their policy autonomy for managing deeper, deeper change in the structures of the global south economies. But more importantly, for immediate effect, they also demanded greater aid, debt relief, and technology transfer. So they also asked for more economic cooperation uh, among developing countries. And more importantly also to fight privatization, uh, more securing rights to nationalize assets, to bring the assets back into the people's power control. And also by extension then also providing restitution for resources depleted through colonialism and occupation. So the NIEO actually for Global South Mark a um, significant turning point. Um, but it was seen as a challenge to the US-led Bretton Woods economic order established in 1944. And by the late 1970s, the global economy, of course, took a different turn. And in response of economic stagnation and inflation in developed countries, there was a shift towards neoliberalism and free market policies. And this policy, what we often call as Washington Consensus, focus more on deregulation, privatization, and liberalization of trade and finance. And these policies were driven mercilessly onto the global south by institutions such as the International Monetary Fund, Fund or IMF, and the World Bank, which then led to the retreat of the NIEO agenda. So then the decades that followed after that were lost to the global south and won mostly by the United States in the reassertion re of a unilateral power, prolonging colonialism in a different form. So then the 1980s that saw a debt crisis in many developing countries and their economies struggling under the burden of high debt payments, falling commodity prices, and then Going to IMF and World Bank, they impose structural adjustment policies as a condition to get these loans, <coughs> which then worsened the situation for many of these countries, affecting the poorest and most vulnerable groups the most. And since then, the majority of developing countries, global south countries, have gone through recurrent economic crises and become serial borrowers from the World Bank and the IMF, with more and more conditions. So, like I said, over the past few decades, both institutions have been advocating for monetarist policies that prioritize markets, business oriented, and reduce governance while also cutting government spending on essential sectors like health and education and social services, which we need the most. This approach is what we call neoliberalism. And it's been, it's been criticized as being more ideological and evidence-based and continues to be pushed to this day. So this set of policies, neoliberal policies, led to reduced number of health workers, reduce of frozen salaries of health workers, which yesterday presentation has said led to brain drain, and, and also higher health services. Uh, feeds through various mechanisms. And of course, all these changes weaken the health system, particularly in community primary care and rural health programs, which local South countries need the most. So decades and decades after this adjustment policy and austerity, weakened primary care networks and severely limiting its capacity to serve the public and to raise public awareness in the community. And this, of course, led to managing um, 
COVID-19 pandemic. This information especially very difficult because there was no existing infrastructure and mechanism to penetrate these communities and build trust. And this adversely impact monitoring and controlling disease outbreaks. So there is a long-standing history of criticisms and evidence regarding the detrimental effects of IMF and World Bank programs in relation to the ability of states, governments, to fulfill their international human rights obligations, such as the right to health. And the evidence suggests that these loan programs increase socioeconomic inequality and lead to lower than expected economic growth in the long term. So it doesn't even fulfill the promise that it gave. And that said, it perpetuates also the country's dependence on these loans. And these institutions also promote the commodification of health and social services by actively promoting privatization and requiring austerity measures as well as economic reforms. And this privatization in the long run, privatization of the state assets that we so, uh, we, hard, we gain in a very hard way during our independence, then privatized, and in the long run it reduced the government's income, resulting then in chronic underinvestment in health and social care, perpetuating austerity, even without the loan programs. So, back to that. For example, many African countries were tied up in IMF loan repayments and lacking funds for emergency preparation. And in January 2020, at the very beginning of the pandemic, 26 out of 54 African countries were undergoing IMF loan programs that demanded austerity, leaving countries with no outside money essentially to spend freely for immediate and robust. COVID-19 response. So then COVID-19 and the consequent economic crisis did not fundamentally change the IMF and World Bank practices. By the end of 2020, there were 130 loans approved by the IMF. Many of these countries were already in debt prior to the pandemic and are still struggling to repay existing loans. And I put an emphasis also on the amount of loans that was provided. It's only a small portion compared to uh, what is needed for emergency COVID-19 pandemic response. And the rest mostly go towards bailing out private lenders. So while the IMF boasted that their, the majority of their COVID-19 loans contains no condition, that's actually not what civil society found. Oxfam study actually reported that the majority of IMF COVID-19 loans still suggested and or demanded sometimes cuts in government spending and cuts in salaries to serve debt repayment and be implemented as soon as 2021 when the pandemic is still raging. So I want to also emphasize again that these countries are considered to be among those with the weakest public health systems. And some are even rife in internal conflicts. Yeah. And austerity measures tend to worsen both aspects in the society, not just health, but also socially. And the IMF COVID-19 laws were also criticized for being late and insufficient to cover the immediate cost, as I've mentioned before. And you know, the thing is, this is quite the usual for these loan programs. We made great, great sacrifices for an, an inadequate amount of money. Some reports also noted that emergency funding had been used to pay off existing debts because these institutions couldn't bring everyone to forgive debt to suspend health, especially for private lenders. So this then further exacerbated the economic situation in many countries. And by early 2022, many countries, most notably in Africa again, were enrolled in another round of IMF programs, and this time through the traditional loan mechanism, which asked for more conditionalities and more stringent also. The World Bank loans is no different. They 
also come with additional policies, usually mandating deregulation and trade liberalization with a focus on public-private partnerships or PPP. Uh, PPP has been uh, heavily criticized as highly and then expensive endeavors, not fit for global south context. And it, it also don't necessarily benefit the poor and may not even benefit the local companies. Uh, so it mainly benefit foreign enterprises, just as it did during colonial days. And the World Bank response to COVID-19 pandemic is also criticized because it provides financial support through loans to already highly indebted countries. And they're also not supporting the trips waiver and not removing financial barriers to access health services. So the majority of their COVID-19 emergency assistance was also channeled through their private financing arm called the International Finance Corporation. The goal of this arm is to support private companies, including those in healthcare sector. So in other words, most of these loans did not necessarily go into strengthening state's capacity, nor did it go to those most in need. But the problems that were created by the World Bank went before that. Um, privatization of healthcare has been strongly promoted by the World Bank in the past three decades and has contributed significantly to the challenges faced by governments during the COVID-19 pandemic, such as the contracting out of testing and contact tracing, which is supposed to be a primary care public health function, and it's already been privatized. And this has been responsible for the failure to have a comprehensive and timely knowledge of providers and a timely knowledge of how SARS-CoV-2 is spreading in the community. A fact that there's a significant resurgence of, of the pandemic and forcing public authorities to control waves and waves of the pandemic, mainly through stay-at-home orders or lockdowns. There were also hurdles, hurdles created by private health insurance. Co-payments and deductibles obviously discouraged sick patients, especially in the rise of unemployment and insecure job contracts. The government tried to have COVID-19 hospitalization fee waiver, but in a private health insurance dominated health system, these costs usually do not extend to treatment costs. So patients get charged anyway. And in some cases, even insured patients have struggled to get their insurance claims paid with various issues cited as the reason, including having pre-existing conditions which, as we all know by now, is what contributes the most to COVID-19 deaths and hospitalizations. And then there was the acceleration of push uh, for digitalization of telemedicine, which added to the difficulties faced by the authorities in managing pandemic, not to mention increasing inequalities in healthcare access in marginalized groups. So overall, I'm just saying the World Bank policies and investments perpetuate the neocolonialism, and it may not even benefit the people of developing countries as they claim or even they intend. And no lessons learned so far, it seems, by these international financial institutions. The World Bank Group's policies and investment in health sector still aims to increase the number of healthcare users and focus on returns of investment. The new pandemic fund is no different. It goes in the same direction. Emphasis on the use of public-private partnerships as means to increase private investment in health sector. And it becomes an attractive choice, of course, for debt-strapped governments. The IMF, also the same. They show softer rhetoric to say, but in practice, like I say, even emergency programs still involve fiscal consolidation and austerity measures. And the new uh, IMF Resilience and Sustainability Trust, which is supposed to 
uh, address climate change and pandemic preparedness is also similar to previous programs. So what should we do moving forward? <laughs> Actually, there are many things we could do. The most obvious is, of course, debt cancellation. It's just not sustainable even if you want to keep going. Many countries have gone into default with no way out, like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Zambia, even Ukraine. And so debt cancellation, it seems like an alien concept these days, like unthinkable. But in the past, it's actually more common. Debt restructuring, including debt cancellation, that is writing off bad debts and unpayable debts is actually a standard feature in capitalism. Yeah. So this, this current mindset that creditors must be paid at all costs must be changed. It takes two hands to clap. You lend the money to people you know who can't pay. We call that loan sharks. Right? So we can put more effort into that. And then also there is another way that I think is popular in Germany um, debt for climate swaps, which is a good idea. So that is a type of debt swap where the debtor in the country, uh, instead of continuing to make external debt payment, uh, in foreign currency especially, uh, they now make payment in local currency to invest and finance their climate projects domestically. It's a great idea. So this can also reduce the level of indebtedness as well as free up fiscal resources to be spent on health sector and green investments. So, the global north and international financial institutions must consider this debt relief and other forms of support that prioritize the needs of the global south rather than perpetuating the cycles of indebtedness uh, as one of the countries with the largest holding power in both IMF and the World Bank. Germany actually has the power to lead in pushing for these measures. It's no easy task, takes very strong political will, but not impossible. And this can start restoring some balance in the global order and political relationships. But these are quick fixes. It would not even begin to address the roots of the problem. And to be able to move forward for a better world, we must stop weaponizing loans, using it to exert power over other nations, imposing certain policies on others for your own interests. So the debate over the global economic order continues, and many in the global south now feel that the current system perpetuates inequality, leaves them at disadvantage, and this is why there are calls for a renewed NIDO and reform the existing global economic institutions.